Uh, I have the great privilege and the honor of actually moderating the session. Uh, I'd like to first introduce the panelists, uh, and I'll do a quick run through of the great panel that we have out here today. Uh, I'll start off with uh, Peter Gartenberg, who's the president of uh, SAP in India. Peter was earlier with Siemens, uh, was the CEO of Siemens in India, and now uh, with SAP in India, the president of SAP in India. Next to him is Rajiv Lal, a good friend of mine. Uh, he's the managing director and CEO of IDFC. Uh, Rajiv has an incredible career, was earlier with the Asian Development Bank, with the, with the World Bank, Morgan Stanley, was a partner at Warburg Pincus, and now the head of IDFC in India. On his left is Carmen. Uh, I, pro I apologize, Carmen, I struggled with your last name, but is it? Becquerel. Becquerel, great. And Carmen is uh, the president of Axiona in Spain. Uh, she was earlier the head of energy consulting at Price PricewaterhouseCoopers, was in the Spanish government for a while, and then in January 2010, took over the renewable energy division of Axiona. On her right is uh, Mr. Tulsi Tanti, which I'm sure a lot of you know. Uh, Mr. Tulsi Tanti created and founded uh, Suzlon, which is today the fourth largest wind energy manufacturer in the world. Uh, he's, uh, he's a hero of the environment by, the time, by Time Magazine, and also, at, and also an awardee of the Entrepreneur of the Year Award by Ernst & Young in 2006. We have Evo uh, De Boer, who is a Special Global Advisor for Climate Change and Sustainability at KPMG in the UK. Uh, Evo was the Executive Secretary of the United Nations Framework for Convention on Climate Change and is a member of the board for Center for Clean Air Policy. He is also a professional fellow at the University of Maastricht. And finally, we have Ravi Sharma, who is the CEO of Adani Par in India. Uh, Ravi has an interesting background, was in the telecom industry for a long time at Alcatel Lucent, was in UB Group earlier on, and now currently the CEO of Adani Par. Uh, I'm Tejpreet Chopra. I used to be with GE for 15 years, uh, and then decided uh, after uh, creating technology all these years to become an entrepreneur to set up a clean energy utility. What I'd like to do this afternoon is actually, before we have a question and answer session, is to open it up to all the panelists and have them spend a few minutes on giving us their perspectives on what we need to do in India to actually get energy and power to the 40% of the people in this country who don't have power today. So Peter, can I turn it over to you and then we'll just go through uh, everybody on sure. stage. Sure, uh, yeah. Good, uh, good afternoon. Uh, I think one of the most fundamental things is that we have to see uh, a national strategy, a nat national energy strategy. And that strategy needs to include a focus on rural uh, electrification. If you want to reach those kind of numbers, that, that means we have to reach out to that two-thirds of the Indian population that uh, is non, not urban. So that, that's a key part of the strategy. Uh, there are some good indications. Uh, if you look at uh, APDRP, this was a very, uh, this has been a, a very strong reform uh, yeah, initiative, uh, but again, mainly focused on the urban environment. Uh, there are also some very good formative uh, activities in the area of smart grid, which we think are going to be really essential in terms of uh, providing a, a far more inclusive uh, uh, energy uh, policy. Uh, obviously from SAP we, we have a strong orientation towards the area of how information technology uh, can uh, achieve these kind of goals and uh, there's a tremendous potential there of marrying a lot of the innovations that have happened uh, in the information and technology field with uh, the, the expertise that we're finding in India. So we can put those two together and, and really go after this, this challenge. Uh, again, in that area, uh, we think there's a huge potential in India in the area of integration. Uh, and again, that goes back again to a, a more national approach. Uh, this is the kind of thing we're working on uh, in, in Europe, in the European Union. So there, of course, we're looking at multinational 
integration and leveraging and pooling of resources and, and power uh, policies. But uh, here, uh, I think we're, we're looking at the subcontinent, or at least India, as a first step. Um, again, uh, the innovation. Uh, there's been tremendous innovation, of course, in generation. I think we'll hear about that. Uh, there's been uh, a fair amount of innovation in transmission. Uh, distribution, a little less. Uh, but the big innovation, again, is in information technology, and that's making things possible like uh, putting microgeneration closer to consumption, uh, thereby achieving far more efficiency and, and spreading those kind of resources. Uh, information technology for managing uh, a much wider uh, energy mix, uh, again, including renewables in that mix. Uh, again, using information technology to reduce the, the massive losses that we have in India today. Uh, 25 to 40 percent are the losses that we're seeing in India. And again, that's, that's a real strong target of information technologies uh, today. Uh, so it goes well beyond that as well in terms of monetization of investment there. Uh, again, information technology is allowing uh, a lot of that to, to take place so that uh, people can, both the public and private sector can invest in that area with a high degree of predictability in terms of uh, return on investments. Uh, one of the most fundamental places though I think we need to start in India is, is get the patient. You know, we, we need to look at it from a medical uh, analogy. You know, we, we need to understand what's, what's the patient. And again, information technology allows you to create a baseline. Where are we? What's the usage patterns? Where are the losses? What's the leakage uh, in the system? Where do we need capacity? How do we do the kind of load balancing and getting that energy uh, mix correct? So that, again, uh, those are some pretty fundamentals that we need to do here. And then there are a number of activities and, and great potential for moving into the whole area of the smart grid and this kind of intelligent uh, energy management for India. Uh, I, uh, so the question is, uh, what does India need to do to reach out to the 360 million people who don't have access to electricity? Um, uh, to my mind, there are uh, three fundamental uh, things that we need to pursue. Uh, first is commercial viability. Second is investment in technology or the use of technology and innovative technology. And the third is sustainability. Let me elaborate on each one of them very briefly. Um, as far as commercial viability is concerned, I, I, there is a long-standing myth that continues to be propagated that the poor are unwilling to pay for services rendered to them. I think the evidence uh, uh, is uh, very clear uh, that in fact the poor um, and even the poorest are willing to pay for services provided they are delivered to them reliably. Um, <clears throat> all the more so, the, each year that goes by, that we have 7 8% GDP growth, the ability of people to pay is also escalating. So user cost um, and cost recovery in infrastructure services in this country is actually very, very feasible, especially for core infrastructure. Um, so what we need to do um, in the electricity supply chain is really drive through the changes um, that have happened upstream already. The most important decision that was taken from a reform perspective in India's power sector was the unbundling of the electricity supply chain. So we separated generation from transmission, from distribution, and opened up generation to private participation. As a result of which, um, uh, there's been a huge amount of investment, private investment, in generating capacity. Um, as against existing installed capacity of 165,000 megawatts, 
we are expecting um, another 70 to 80,000 megawatts to be functioning by 2013, 2014. And of that, uh, the bulk of it is actually private generating capacity. So that by 2000, 2014, we should have about 35%, we estimate, of total generating capacity that will actually be in private hands. That same dynamic needs to now be replicated in the transmission chain and eventually in the distribution chain. Uh, I think that the, the logic and the momentum of accumulated changes so far um, is such that that degree of opening up and private participation, both in transmission and in distribution, is only a matter of time. And we are beginning to see signs of it uh, picking up. So in transmission, um, there is an open invitation now um, for PPP structures for investment in transmission that is beginning to pick up pace. In distribution, it's the slowest uh, um, uh, progress so far, but there are signs that um, it is imminent. At least that would be my bet. Um, second uh, initiative that we need to drive is investment in technology or aggressive use of technology. Um, and then there is, uh, by that what I mean is uh, there is absolutely no reason why we cannot uh, conceive of a different architecture uh, to deliver electricity to the ultimate consumer than other countries. Off-grid electric electricity supply is a huge opportunity for rural India um, and that we need to take very, very seriously. My concern is that it will be much lower cost. Um, it, is, uh, it is therefore much more easily scalable. Uh, time to delivery can be faster. Um, and the rural poor can be served much more effectively. My concern, however, is, is really with the, uh, with the psyche of legacy, uh, legacy systems um, and, and engineering mindsets, uh, uh, which reflect then in government institutions, um, in the mindset of financiers, in the mindset of even entrepreneurs, uh, that, will, that are forcing us um, through sheer momentum of the past to pursue only traditional solutions um, for electricity supply. And we, we, we have an opportunity, uh, but I, I'm, not, I'm not sure what it will take for us to um, break new ground and think about architecture and technology in electricity supply differently, uh, uh, delivery differently from in the past. Final point very quickly is on sustainability. Same, uh, same sort of argument applies. Uh, we have an opportunity to uh, reinvent the way we develop. Um, there is no reason for our energy intensity of GDP growth to follow the same trajectory as in China. Indeed, if we follow the same trajectory as in China, it is a recipe for environmental disaster. There are lots of people in this country that grasp that, but for the same reasons as we have um, that are coming in the way of re-architecting um, off-grid uh, electricity supply, um, uh, changing mindsets so that we can, we can find alternative solutions is proving hard. Very important beginning has been made in India through the renewables policy, the solar mission that I'm sure Carmen is going to talk about, uh, but that needs much, much greater momentum. <clears throat> Carmen, can you Thank just, you. Carmen, before you op start your opening remarks, can you just touch a little bit about the challenges? I know Axion has done some off-grid difficult projects in places like Peru. Can you l touch a little bit about the more difficult projects and off-grid uh, you know, solutions that you provided at Axion? Yes, of course. Uh, maybe just one introduction. We have just heard that uh, India uh, will pass from 1.6 gigawatts installed uh, in power capacity to 8 uh, gigawatts installed in 2013. So that means to multiply for five times and uh, to face such a challenge for the Indian government, I think it's uh, quite quite an important, they have to think a lot about that. So uh, speaking about isolated areas, uh, it's true that we have quite a nice experience in ACCIONA, 
uh, we work through a foundation in the north of Peru trying to provide electricity to the poorest people. Uh, and, uh, you know, we have had to face several problems, uh, which uh, probably it will be more or less the same in the goals or in the targets that the Indian government has right now. Uh, you know, we try to, we try to uh, provide electricity to the families just with a PV device, with a battery, and so on. So uh, even considering that the investment could be, uh, could be subsidized in some way, uh, the problem that we have to, to face out is uh, how we can ensure the sustainability of this kind of devices, of this kind of uh, uh, of this kind of supply. So we have decided to develop a social uh, social enterprise. And then the problem that we have is that to ensure the operation and maintenance, and to ensure the reserve uh, money for the for the battery to change the battery in five or six years. Uh, we ask for the people around $3 per month. Uh, if we compare that with the tariff that the poorest people connected to the grid has in, in the country, the problem is that they pay around $1.5. So that's not fair at all. It's impossible to accept that one person with a PV system, so with two lamps and one plug for four hours of, of supply to have uh, uh, three dollars per month, and then people connected in the grid, just the neighbors several kilometers ago, have to pay only 1.5. So one of the challenges for the governments, I think, if they want to develop this kind of isolated uh, supply, is just to ensure that they subsidize in the same way that they do to the uh, people connected to the, to the grid and to ensure that the operation and maintenance of these kind of devices and the, and the maintenance which suppose just to change the battery can be ensured because of this kind of, uh, of subsidies. I know that uh, here it happens more or less uh, the same as, as, we, as the problem we, we have in Peru and probably it's necessary to solve it if uh, if the government won't succeed with the solar mission and with another aspect of this problem. Thank you. Dr. Bay. Yes. <clears throat> Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, for the country like India, when the 1.2 billion populations we are and the per capita energy consumptions, it's nearly 700 kilowatt hours are there, which is the lowest in the, in the globally. So it's a huge need of the energy is there. No doubt uh, we need in a times, because by 2020, also it's nearly 2.5 times need of energy is there compared to the current established base of the 160 gigawatt. So it's a great challenge and great opportunity in the country like India we have. But at the same time, the three important task is very important is there. A is to bring the energy securities for the countries, because that is the biggest risk uh, India has. And we are extremely vulnerable in this area, so we need to focus on energy security. Second is a low carbon economy growth, so we cannot grow such a way to damage the environment and not to bring the sustainability for the globe. The third important part is uh, this energy should be affordable for 1.2 billion populations. I think it's a great challenge for the, our country is there. And that's the, the things we have to address. So what should be the focus area is required. We need each and every source of energy. We cannot rely on the one or two source, but we have to concentrate on that, which can satisfy these three criteria, energy securities, the low carbon economy, and the same type affordable energy. So ultimate objective is very clear. The power sector, we have to grow in a such a way, so it's bring an inclusive growth, and same time it should be a long-term sustainable economy. I think that's the important. We don't want to follow the, the way developed world is currently facing on economic situations and the certain crisis and other things. So we have a great opportunity to grow in a differently and we can learn out of that and we can establish efficiently. So within that, one of the area where I have a huge 
interest is there, it's a renewable energy. We strongly believe, sir, that it can change this world in a different way. So we have to utilize this because what is the current our challenge in India is there. The maximum population are living in a rural part of India is there. We have built a nearly six thousand megawatt of wind projects in the country and all the projects in the rural part of that. And we have observed and realized that it is a bringing a huge sustainability because we are retaining the populations in the rural part, first of all. So it's not becoming burden to the, to the cities like uh, Delhi and Bombay. So that is the one. Second thing, they are getting a huge energy because our economy is heavily dependent on agriculture crop. So they are getting the huge energy to, to concentrate on agriculture production. And that is the another security is important for 1.2 billion population is a food securities. So that's will bring the good sustainable development is bringing. And this energy is a long term point of view. It's a low cost is there because we can hedge the power cost in the long run because we are not using the fuels. And that is giving a very good thing is there. The country like India has nearly 100 gigawatts is a potentiality of the wind is there out of nearly 10 to 12 gigawatt we have harnessed. So it's a great opportunities are there. And the topmost is the coming out, if we concentrate on a parallelly to off-grid solutions as per the global predictions by 2030, the world will use 30% energy through the off-grid. And that will be the best solutions are for the country like India is we have. So we can utilize the off-grid solution in this rural development where 100,000 the village we doesn't have access of the grid and other thing. And it's a huge and high capital intensive investment is there which is not affordable country like India and same time the population cannot afford the cost of energy. So these are becoming a very crucial situation. So it's off-grid solutions can bring the very big way for the development of the rural economy and we can build the, our economy more sustainable way. So the nut cells is for me is a very important. The country has a great technology of the renewables because today we are exporting this technology into 22 countries in the developed world. So we are 100% self-sustainable is there. We have a great technology for the renewables. We can utilize there, bring the energy securities, bring the low carbon economy, and also it's affordable energy to the, to the rural country. And we can bring the, the rural economy more sustainable way. I think this is the great solutions for our country to bring the in inclusive, the solutions and sustainable development for the country. Thank you. Eva, over to you. Eva, can I just ask you one more question to address when you have your opening remarks, which is, do you ever face the philosophical challenge where there's so many people in our country who can't afford power and a point that Tulsi Bhai just said was, do you, have, you know, should a person who hasn't seen power all his life, should he pay for a little more expensive clean energy, or should he be given the cheapest form of power, which today is coal? So I'd love to hear your thoughts on that as well. well <clears throat> maybe to start with that very point, it, it depends, of course, on what your definition of cheap is, and what you factor or what you don't factor into cheap. If, if you have the situation which we have at the moment, namely that you can pump greenhouse gases into the atmosphere unrestricted at no cost whatsoever, um, whereas somebody that is trying to produce renewable energy uh, is, is unable to, to cope with that, then yes, the, 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 the cost of renewables will be higher. But to my mind, ultimately, the challenge is to factor the cost of pollution fairly into the price of energy and into the price of products, and then the innovation will, will happen. So that's the direct answer to your question. Um, having been involved in the global negotiations for the past four years, I wanted to come at this initially from a slightly more, more global level uh, and, and point out that even if you happen not to be a believer in, in climate change, and there seems to be a growing number of people that are actually not believers in climate change, then to point out that there are basically at least four other global trends which are pushing things in fundamentally the same direction. And that's a trend on energy prices, a trend on energy security, a trend on material scarcity, and a fourth and very important trend, which is a global population which is heading for nine billion people that simply cannot be accommodated on this planet with the economic model that we have at the moment. So even if you happen to be the climate change skeptic in the room, I think, or I hope that you would agree that those other global trends are basically taking us uh, in, in the same direction. And as a consequence of that, what we're going to do over the coming five or 10 years, whether it's in India or in the United States or in, the, in, in, in Europe, is fundamentally going to shape the future of this planet 
for decades to come. Let me give you one example. The International Energy Agency has calculated that as we all begin to recover from uh, the economic crisis, that upwards of $20 trillion is going to be invested in the energy sector, about half in industrialized nations, about half in developing countries. And if we invest that $20 trillion plus without taking climate change into account and without taking some of those other trends into account, it's going to be pushing global emissions up by 50% by the middle of the century, whereas the scientific community is telling us that the emissions need to be down by 50% if we have any chance to have any chance of, of coping with, with climate change. So that's the broader challenge that we're facing. And what you're hearing, I think, from all of the panelists so far is that sustainability is, uh, is, is the answer to that uh, challenge. Now, let's break that down a little bit further. What does that mean? Well, first of all, it means for me setting very clear goals at both the international and the national level, because there's probably nothing worse for the business community than to have lack of clarity on where policymakers intend to go on this process at both an international uh, and, and a national level. And those need to be very clear goals, targets, and, uh, and action plans. <coughs> a second opportunity, and this has been referred to as well so far, um, is, is understand how you can use more efficiently what you have already. How can you reduce waste, for example, in transmission? How can you enhance efficiency? How can you use what you have at the moment more frugally which implies understanding your business, understanding your emissions, understanding your profile, and understanding where you want to go. <clears throat> My third point would be to seek and realize um, innovation and, and the financing of innovation in, in new and creative ways. I've seen in, in this country in recent years the most incredible evolution of, of, of small finance institutions that are delivering practical solutions on the ground and similarly, I think that there is a huge opportunity at the international level to reform some of the financial mechanisms that we have to make them more suitable to driving this, uh, to driving this sustainability uh, agenda and to driving innovation. And my final point would be to um, empower local action, to empower action at, at, the, uh, at the local level. Something has already been said by the other panelists about off-grid uh, solutions. I think you have a fantastic experience in India with, uh, with rural development. There are, I believe, 40,000 small banks in rural areas uh, in this country. And can those banks, those financial institutions, not also be mobilized to help us get in this country to a solution on the climate and energy challenge as well? Thank you. Ravi, over to you. Well, thank you very much. A uh, few lines about uh, Adani Group, where I come from. It is one of the fastest growing group, uh, which has done, which has achieved from 100 million to 6 billion of revenue within 10 years of time. Starting with uh, trading business and then into edible oil and some other businesses. It, it went into the port business, and today we have the largest port operations in India in the private sector. We have now concentrated and focused to get into the infrastructure sector, which basically means ports, power, and the coal mining operations. In the area of ports, we operate two ports, which is in Mundra and the Hedge, and five more are under construction, three in India, two are outside India, and our goal is to create a capacity of 200 million ton of cargo <coughs> capacity within a period of five to seven years. In the area of power, we are currently constructing 16,000 megawatt, and which we, we feel that by, by 2014, we would have done 16,000 megawatt in India, and we hope to create about 20,000, if, if not more than 20,000 megawatt by 2020. In the area of coal mining, we are the largest mine development operator in India, having interest in mines in Australia and Indonesia, and we are the largest coal trader in India. Our goal is to create our own mining operations and a capacity of 200 million tons by 2020. This is the background of, of our company. Uh, now let me come back to the point as to how to empower the consumer or the Indian population which is not connected. The moment we talk about the empowerment it is a factor of only two things, availability and affordability. 
But before I go to availability and affordability, let me just describe the scenario. We have a scenario where we produce 165,000 megawatt, out of which 53% comes from coal, 23 from hydro, 11 from gas, and the rest. Now, when we start looking at this, we also have to look as to where we are in terms of our requirement and availability. When we look at generation, we are average on, on the average side, we are 10% short. But when we look at regions, it is anywhere between 0% to 25%. When we look at uh, uh, transmission, sorry, when we look at peak, it is average 13%, but it ranges from 10% to 33%. When we look at transmission, the losses are anywhere between 8 to 12%. And when we look at distribution, the average is 30%, but it ranges anywhere between 10% to 68%. So that is the overall range. When we look at our power load factor as to what is the efficiency of plant which they operate, the national average is 71%. So the point which I am wanting to make, the first point when we have to make it available, there are two ways, as Tanti Bhai was saying and my friend was saying, that we have to make sure that what is there with us, we stop the waste and we increase the efficiency. The stoppage of wastage, and I just want to put these figures, that means 30% in terms of PLF, which can be improved. There is no reason that why it cannot work better. 10% on transmission and 30% on distribution. To so this 70% wastage which exists in our system, there is no reason that why <coughs> it cannot be brought down if it cannot be made zero. So this will, this will create the affordability factor, what we are talking about. Now let us talk about the availability factor. I'm not going to the innovation part first, in innovation or the new factors which will improve it, and I'll come second to it. In my mind, there are four factors which are required to be taken care of before we can really talk about the empowerment part. The first is resource and distribution. The second one is the consumption efficiency. And the third one is the government will. If the government will is not there, nothing will work. And the fourth thing is that we have to be very careful and very conscious about the environment in which we live. The moment we talk about the resource and distribution, it basically means that we have to increase our generation capacity, even after the fact that we are able to plug the hole in this losses, what we just talked about. So we have to increase the the, the availability, we have to increase the generation. So the moment you talk about generation increase, the factor which we play, which play a role is the fuel, which is very, very important. And that fuel, it differs from, uh, from uh, the kind of power plant we have for hydro, for coal, uh, and, and for solar, and others. That is one part. The second part is the machinery which is required in it. I am not going into finance because finance is a very different thing. And the third is the mining. I just want to take example on the coal part. That the coal availability in India is coming through a single company. Now, of course, that company is efficient, but I am a firm believer that unless there is a competition, the efficiency of any operation cannot be increased or innovation can be put there. <coughs> So what I am saying is that to increase the efficiency of, of the system and to upgrade this availability in a time manner, not only in the time manner, but at a fast pace, there has to be competition in the mining sector. There has to be the involvement of new technology and new equipments in the mining sector. I feel that the government should take initiative, giving incentive and motivation for using new technology, new equipment. There is a second point. Second part is, which also linked to environment part, that there is a lot of transportation which happens of the coal. I would like to just inform uh, the gathering that by 2017, it is expected that 200 million tons of coal will be imported in India. The way the policy is structured, there are plants with our, which are at the pit, hole, uh, uh, pit head, but they receive imported coal, that means 
from west to east, coal travels, which is the imported coal, and from east to west it goes, which is the mine coal, which is the indigenous coal. Now, this unnecessary transportation which is happening, it creates only a loss of 20,000 crores a year. So this is the losses which we take, apart from the environmental Im impact which, which it takes. Now, we, when we come to the transmission side, the, so what, what I feel? I feel that on the mining side, there has to be a particular effort. On the transportation side and the linkage side, there has to be a policy change. And number three, the supercritical technology, which is imperative and which increases and enhances the, the performance of, of not only the generation, but also the environmental impact, because it creates one-third CO2, and its efficiency is at least 12 to 15 percent more than the normal super, uh, subcritical technology. When we come to the, the transmission side, I think there has to be much more participation from the private company. There has to be much more high voltage uh, DC lines which have to be created so that the losses can be decreased. When come to distribution, obviously distribution is uh, far more political than the generation and the transmission. So that is where comes the government will. Government will, first of all, is to decide the subsidy, how the subsidy has to go, how the center, this, this part of uh, uh, the equilibrium has to be distributed among the private people, how it has to be delicensed, how more and more privatization has to happen. But this is far more politically sensitive subject than only a business subject. I see no reason why this cannot be changed if it goes into private sector and the subsidy mechanism has to change. Of course, uh, the renewable technology uh, part, and I would only take on the solar part. The solar is one of the best technology for the greener earth. But do we realize that if we take the target of 20,000 megawatt, uh, megawatt by 2020, we have a subsidy bill of $40 billion. Now, does it create demand? I feel that it is good, but I think a lot of technology has to help itself. Unless there is a technology breakthrough that it can be supported and it can be supported on its own, it will become really difficult for any government to provide that subsidy. And I feel that at, at the end of it, somewhere, it will create a, uh, create a hurdle in itself. So I think these are some of the points which I just wanted to put forth. And I feel that unless there is a good fuel security for the generation, unless there is an efficiency system which is built there, which, which takes both part, stop the waste, increase the efficiency, and unless there is a government will, it is not possible to do this empowerment. Thanks a lot uh, for that, uh, Ravi. Uh, Raji, let me turn to you, and let me just check with you. You finance a lot of projects all over the country. What are the kind of challenges you feel? On one hand, you know, I think, Ivo, you mentioned there's this $20 trillion of spending that's going to happen in the, in, the sphere, in the sphere of energy. So specifically with financing of all these projects, what should we do as a country more to attract this, this capital into the country? Uh, is there some policy changes the government needs to do to make sure we get more capital to fund all these investments? The financing challenges are uh, two types. One is with respect to the availability of equity risk capital. The other one is with respect to the availability of long-term uh, debt financing. Um, for equity risk capital, uh, <clears throat> uh, the uh, very important source um, of financing has been our equity capital markets. And in fact, um, a lot of the momentum of investment demand in the infrastructure space um, has held up because our equity capital markets are indeed um, very buoyant and have done extremely well. Um, <clears throat> uh, the vulnerability with respect to uh, equity is really the health of the equity markets. So if there is um, volatility in the equity markets, um, it would be very damaging to sentiment and risk-taking capacity of private investors in this country. Um, 
It's not so much, therefore, the availability, and uh, there's no policy reform as such in public markets, equity markets that really need to be pursued. Our equity markets are very liquid and very deep, but it's, the, it's just the volatility of that market, and therefore, um, the, the, the sustained access um, to that form of uh, equity financing for our entrepreneurs, um, that is an issue of macro policy concern. Um, and even there, it's, it's, a, it's a global issue uh, because uh, the volatility of international capital in particular that underpins um, um, uh, the health of our, uh, the performance of our equity markets is not really within the control of the government of India. I think some steps can be uh, taken to deepen domestic markets for earlier stage equity. Um, so when we're talking about private equity or mezzanine type of capital uh, to be made available for the development of infrastructure projects. There are insufficient domestic institutional um, receptacles um, um, to handle that kind of money. So we, we ironically depend, despite our very high levels of household savings, we depend very heavily on overseas sources of financing for that type of equity capital. For debt financing, uh, uh, so far so good. Uh, ours is a very bank-centric financial system, um, and the bulk of the burden of financing infrastructure has fallen uh, to the banks so far. Um, the banks have capacity maybe for another two, three years um, to carry this pace of demand um, for financing. But beyond that, uh, issues of risk management will become problematic. And the usual risk management problems in the banking system uh, uh, relating to infrastructure uh, are asset liability mismatches. <coughs> so they're the need of the hour. We've been aware of it for many, many years now. And the, need, the need is really to develop deep and liquid uh, corporate bond markets. Um, I think more than ever, the government is focusing um, on making that happen, but um, there is still a long way to go. And it's, uh, again, my feeling is that it's beyond um, any particular policy intervention. Um, the, the challenge we face is really the nature of savings in this country. Um, as long as the bulk of our savings remain in banks, um, they do not move to insurance companies and pension funds, uh, our ability to create a domestic corporate bond market will be curtailed. So that shift of savings, household savings, from the banks to contractual savings, as they're called, is happening. But it isn't happening at the pace that um, uh, could serve the immediate requirements um, of the infrastructure sector. So there again, we will have to turn from some assistance from overseas uh, for sources of long-term financing. Thanks, Rajiv. Carmen, can you just address this? Given the financial crisis in Europe the last few years and in, and in, the, and in the U.S., how, how, what kind of appetite do renewable companies like yourself have to actually putting capital to work in emerging markets like in India, Indonesia, and China, uh, given all the problems that a lot of companies have had in the last few years back in, in Europe itself? So what is your view on, you know, Axion or any other large utility in Europe coming and investing big sums of money into emerging markets like this? Well, you know, we're, we are working in 11 countries, and I have to say that more or less we have the same problems all around the world. So uh, to decide where to, where to invest or which are the best projects, uh, all the process of selection is quite complex. but. Anyway, I think there are f four, four elements which have to be common in all the, in, in the countries just to be chosen to invest, um, especially in the future, if we really we want to face the future with a sustainable development committed with renewables. First, I think uh, one key element I'm sure that Ivo can, can can uh, discuss about that is just pricing the CO2 
Well, we are discussing always about the subsidies in renewables, but we have to discuss also how to price in the CO2, how uh, the rest of the fossil fuel technologies uh, will have to internalize the, this, this, uh, this problem with the environment. So taxation can be one way, but there are several ways, several different ways. So pricing the CO2 in the uh, energy systems, I think, is one of the, the key elements to ensure the development of renewables. So uh, second one, um, I think uh, in the short future, the governments have to do a clear effort to eliminate uh, progressively the subsidies to the, to the fossil fuels. Um, I know that last week uh, the, the International Energy Agency has presented the World Energy Outlook of 2010, and he identified $600 billion uh, of subsidies in fossil fuels uh, worldwide. So to finish with this uh, is one, another key element to ensure the competitiveness of renewables. And third, at, at, and quite important, is to ensure a regulatory market, a regulatory framework, transparent, predictable, and stable. The point is that uh, we need we need money. Well, I mean, we can put our equity, but we need money from the financial institutions. So, if we haven't one stable framework but a clear and a stable framework, that's impossible to get the money. So the return is impossible, and then it's a, a vicious circle, we don't finish. So pricing CO2 to finish with the subsidies of fossil fuels, uh, quite, uh, one a stable regulatory framework, I think those are the three key elements we need for the future to enhance the development of renewables, and I think uh, there are a lot, of, a lot of efforts here in India just focusing some of these aspects. Uh, mm, it's difficult, for instance, to ensure the stability of the regulatory framework, but I think it has been quite a clear commitment from the government to ensure that uh, the future include the renewables in the mix. Good, thanks. Tulsibar, you've seen the whole renewable industry grow over your career. Can you talk a little bit about, is the government doing enough to promote renewable energy in this country? If not, should they be doing something more? And the second thing I want to ask you is, what should the government be doing? If the government's done the rural electrification program, what more should the government do in order for us to get the power to the people who need it? Are we just focusing on more on-grid getting urban power, or are we doing enough to get rural power as well? No, I agree. <clears throat> India has a great uh, uh, resources of the renewables. Nearly the 100 gigawatt size of the wind resources are available in onshore and offshore. So that's a great is there. The 10 gigawatt is nearly utilized, and there is a 90 percent is available is there. By 2020, the, the industries are ready to deliver nearly 50 gigawatt. But when we are focusing how to execute that, why? One side is that we have a 10 to 10 percent grid deficit, and other side need of energy high. Why it is not moving so aggressively? So there is a good momentum is there. No doubt India is the fourth largest country to produce wind energy, and we are well positioning is there. Even our wind resource base and wind installation base is greater than the nuclear is also there. So the renewable front, India is doing a quite satisfactory, but it's, it's still not enough. The first topmost is required is a regulatory frameworks. A lot of initiatives in the last two, three years has changed the environment, and now government is taking a serious actions because the prime minister has set the targets of the 15 percent renewable has to come by 2020. So it's a good uh, this, uh, the target set point is there. The top of that, the most important in country, India, is important is the regulatory frameworks. So the new mechanisms are introducing. One of these is uh, GBI the generation-based incentives. The earlier whole industries was running in a depreciation concepts and the tax benefit point of view. So now onwards it will be, after one year, it will be not on a tax mechanism, but it will go in a generation-based incentive. It's a very good uh, mechanism. And the top of that regulatory has bring out the REC. It's a renewable en energy 
the certificate mechanism. It is a tradable certificate, and it is a giving a huge balanced distribution of the, the renewable development in the countries. So these mechanisms are very good is there. But still, we have to work a lot of things on a regulatory framework part of you. We strongly believe is the regulator can bring the new mechanisms which can give the huge long-term sustainable development in a renewable is there. The biggest constraint we, we are facing in a two major area is a renewable development in a country. The one is a grid infrastructure, which is a very, uh, clear, uh, very identical for the whole world we are facing, not just India. But here it is a we have to build the new infrastructure, and that's the required. And those infrastructure is required because wind resources are available in a rural part of the countries and we, do, we don't have an infrastructure of the grid. So first is a huge capital investment is necessary for that and required for the policy framework for the transmission point of view. I'm not, in, not talking about the smart grid point of view because it's too early for the India. The first is required basic infrastructure of the grid investment and that's the policy framework is very important is coming out. The second part is there we required a huge capital in, in investment so we have to attract the equity and the, and the project financing and for that the right policy frameworks and right the bankable PPA is required which is yet not good enough is there. A lot of improvement is there but we required a long term financing point of view 20 years or 25 years financing which is yet the financing mechanisms of the country is not yet grown on that level. And it's a huge investment we are talking on this front. So these are the points are in, in, important is coming out. And the third most uh, the important part is which is directly affecting the consumers. We have to bring the policy framework in a two different mechanisms because the two things are important. If you want to preserve and utilize this energy more efficient way, it is a required dynamic tariff mechanisms. It is a very clear is a dynamic tariff mechanisms is, a, is, is there within the 24 hours. Based on the time zone point of view, the energy price should be volatile. So that is the one of the regulatory initiatives are important. The country like India is a so high growth and same time is the constraint of the energy. So we can evenly distribute our infrastructure and capex investment what we have today we can utilize efficiently and we can bring the energy more efficiently to immediately to everybody. I see it's a low hanging fruits, we can immediately leverage that. And that's only possible by the, the regulatory frameworks. The second is coming out key, the infrastructure investment in a such a way of the grid, we can do the complete global ma uh, India mappings and we have to put the investment on the grid infrastructure point of view based on the resource base rather than the, the consumption base. The most of the part of the world has infrastructure is built based on the consumption targets. But here we have to go other way around, where the wind is available, where solar is available, where the, the coal based resources are available, where the nuclear is feasible. All should be the future mapping should be done and infrastructure should be invested on a such a way and, and to connect more efficient uh, uh, direction is there. The third area again is affecting to the consumer point of view and that is a becoming is the India is a two different level of the population is there. One, 400 million is living below 1.25 uh, uh, dollar per day income source and one population is living in a, in a high, uh, high economy zone. So in that environment, one part of the population can afford the energy price, another part cannot afford the, the energy price. So the annual requirement of any normal house, it's a thousand KWH is there. The first thousand KWH should be the very low price mechanism. And if you are consuming more and more energy, your house is consuming 10,000 KWH, you have to pay three, four times more energy price. So that will give, okay, who will pay for that? It cannot be possible uniform pricing uh, mechanism or tariff mechanism for each and every population. It's not practically possible. There, the second area, also regulator roles are becoming very important to bring that mechanism. So the two part is becoming the investment, uh, the phase of the grid infrastructure to bring the more and more renewable uh, assets and to bring uh, the more sustainable economy. And the same time we are mitigating the climate uh, change risk. When we are asking whether it is a renewable economical or not, the cost of energy in today of the, from the wind is it's coming out nearly three, three rupees to five rupees range. It's depend on the windy sites and other thing. The beauty is there, we are going closer to the closer to the consumers. We don't require a large transmission to mobilize those energy from one part to other part of the country. 
we can locally produce and locally consume. So it's the indirectly partial off-grid mechanisms are there. So the cost of energy is not expensive because the, now the, the technology has developed and, and the large size of the projects and the, some of the effective low cost of the funds because that is the only raw material for the wind, wind energy is there. So it's a between this range, three rupees to five rupees range, cost of energy, which is a very affordable, which we can hedge for the next 20 years. It's not uh, increasing because if you ask me after 10 years by 2020, the cost of energy in India will be almost double. Today we are paying five rupees. Tomorrow we will pay 10 rupees. But this renewable energy cost will not increase. So it's a giving a very strong, in, inclusive, sustainable development. And the same time, rural, rural economy growth and agriculture benefit. I think that's the, the thing. Is, but the key role is coming again back to the government and the policy framework, regulatory part, and the strong governance systems so that we can attract the huge capital. And the same time, the effic effective the large investment in the grid and infrastructure will bring the huge uh, opportunity for the renewable development and it will bring the lo lot of good sustainable economy, the growth in the country in, like India. Thanks very much. Uh, Eva, just a very quick question before I start opening it out to the crowd. What's your view on the whole CDM mechanism? Is that going to stay in place? Uh, is that going to go away? And secondly, uh, a question for you also, Peter, is that from a technology perspective, are you seeing any new technologies that are coming in that can really help uh, the growth of affordable power in, in a distributed manner for a country like ours? So, Eva, do you want to comment on the whole CDM mechanism? Well, for those of you that are not familiar with it, the Clean Development Mechanism is a mechanism that allows industrialized countries or companies the choice between achieving an emission reduction at home or doing it more cheaply somewhere else, for example, in a developing country. Um, I, I think that that mechanism will continue. I hope that in the course of its continuation that that mechanism will be significantly improved because it's, in, in, it's, it's, it's a horrible bureaucracy, to be quite honest, uh, uh, at the moment, and it, and it could do with some improvements. But the, the bigger challenge for me is how do we complement the, the clean development mechanism with other financial tools? For example, um, if, if national action is going to be taken, can that national action be, be registered and recognized in a certain place and then also be rewarded? Uh, can we create possibilities whereby engaging on a climate change framework is not just a government to government exercise, but also creates an opportunities for businesses to engage? So for example, when you come with a large renewable energy uh, initiative, which is part of a national strategy, that that initiative can be linked up to international finance. And similarly, I think it must be possible to create new financial tools, whether it's bonds or, or other investment opportunities, whereby you can seek international finance to support the achievement of, of national strategic goals and hopefully blend very intelligently that international finance um, with domestic finance. So you asked for a very short answer. Um, yes, I think the CDM will continue. I hope it will continue in, in uh, improved form. But above all, I hope it will be complemented by a suite of other financial instruments. And I think that there are real creative opportunities there. Peter, just very quickly before I open it up to the crowd, from a technology perspective, given your experience at Siemens, uh, do you think there are new technologies that India can use in terms of energy efficiency or other innovations that can really make a, that can get, that can be put to use in a country like India? I would say it's more what's happening at SAP that can have an impact. It's in the IT area that we can immediately and we already are going after waste, and I think that was that was pointed out. That's the that's the easy one because it's good business. It, it deals with the sustainability, environmental side of it. It, it makes power more affordable. So there, there's technology right now, and we're already uh, deploying a lot of that in India, uh, both in the public and the private sector. And it's a very easy adoption because it just it makes sense very, very quickly. Uh, in terms of integrating the renewables and all that, uh, again, that's an area uh, that SAP's done a lot of work in, in terms of integrated uh, grid, off-grid, integrating renewables, and again, it goes after the same target again. It eliminates waste, drives down cost, uh, creates predictability. So again, a, a lot of the solutions 
uh, are there from an IT standpoint that don't require huge capital investments. And, uh, and it's a way of bringing in a whole diverse variety of uh, energy sources. So there's a great opportunity there. Great. What I'd like to do is open it up to the crowd. If the crowd has any questions, uh, can we get a mic uh, out there? Hi, I'm Priyanka. Thank you so much for having this uh, discussion. Uh, my question is that do you think having a carbon credit framework for India would be able to address some of the problems we're facing right now? Or do you think it's just going to add to more problems like you know, um, uh, transparency and stuff like that. And my second question would be, um, like government support, governance, transparency, I've heard this in every single session I've been going for. Um, what exactly is being done over here to address this? Who is doing this? Who is checking on this? You know, and when can we say would we finally reach that level of <laughs> governance, transparency, etc.? I mean, what's can you, can you tell me more as to what's being done to manifest this idea? You know, uh, these are the two questions which I have for the panel. Great, thanks. Uh, Eva, do you want to take the one on? Transparency? On, no, the other one. <laughs> 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 if you've got some good ideas, we'll be happy to hear you. I, I, I couldn't quite catch the first one. Can, can the first question was on, carb on, on the carbon framework and whether it will help or not help a country like in India, right? carbon framework absolutely helps a country like India um, for a number of reasons. First of all, because I think it is generally internationally historically or internationally recognized that India's historic responsibility for this issue uh, is, is minuscule and therefore any equitable international regime will give, create more space for India to grow vis-a-vis -vis countries that have contributed uh, more to this problem. Secondly, I think that virtually every panelist has talked about waste. And one of the challenges is, can you use an international regime to turn waste into profit? For example, if you, if you realize very cost-effective energy efficiency options, can you then link those energy, options, energy efficiency options up to international finance? If there is a huge potential for renewable energy, can you somehow, through a carbon uh, market, attract international finance in order to achieve some of those local sustainability goals. So just for those two reasons, and I can go on, go on for hours, which you don't want me to, but just for those two reasons, I think absolutely yes, it is in this country's interest. I don't know. Uh, if it's okay, I'd rather pass on the question on transparency. I'm not sure what, if anybody on this panel wants to talk. I'd rather focus it on energy, if you don't mind. Yeah. Well, there, there, there is a, India is participating in this clean development mechanism, which is attracting actually a lot of international capital towards all kinds of initiatives uh, in this country. The question is, I suppose the question for me is, can the national plan, can the national goals be turned into a strategy which is then real, <coughs> measurable and verifiable, and as a result of that can be linked to international financial instruments? Great. Uh, Tulsi, by your point? Just, uh, just to add uh, the, the point, because when we are talking about the, the country is in a, in a developing phase, the, the global framework for the CO2 is extremely important is there. So the COP15 and now the, in a COP16, if there is a, some global framework will come out, either it is a CO2 tax mechanisms or it can be continue on the CD, CDM mechanism, but a new form of the frame, that is very important. First, we have to set the global frameworks. And then part of the country like India, we have to set, compared to our GDP growth, what should be the CO2 reduction framework we can bring and align with the global framework. And then we have to bring the, the regulatory mechanisms to investment and other part of that. I think it, it's too early because today we have only the CDM mechanisms and which is expiring by 2012. And we don't have a clear visibility in the global framework so we don't see that can bring immediate benefit of that. But without that also, we can bring an Indian perspectives based on our economic growth and based on our, the power sector point of view and how to mitigate the climate risk to bring that, that framework, I think the Prime Minister has which set the 15 persons, the targets we can set the, by 2020 and we can reduce by 20 percent our CO2 by 2020 compared to the, our GDP growth the per capita, 
So that can bring us the good sustainable development. Same time, we can participate in a, the global framework. Maybe COP16, I'm not optimistic, but maybe COP17 or COP18, some result on some framework has to come. And, and we need a, for that uh, the global sense of urgency. So then we can bring that uh, mechanisms. And I know we're uh, running out of time. Uh, we have a whole bunch of questions. I don't, can, can we get a few? Go ahead. Yes. Go ahead. Uh, thank you. Uh, it's interesting for, to me to hear this, this technical and financing and, and, and uh, technical problems that you, that you, you find. But I think that, uh, that you're overlooking something much more important, I think, that, that really makes, even if you could fix these problems, uh, and I think there's a political issue. Namely, I think the, the government's uh, plans to increase capacity is it's a pipe dream, essentially. And we should look at it as a pipe dream on the basis of very difficult political challenges that the country faces. Uh, the U.S. India nuclear deal was uh, very traumatic for the for the for the U.K. coalition last last term around. Uh, parts of the country are under next light uh, control, which makes you know generation transmission very difficult in any in, in, in real sense. And uh, a third area would be essentially that you have any type of, any effort that you make to try to to uh, have a hydroelectric power plant gets bogged down on public interest litigation, for instance, for years. And so can, can, even if you could fix these problems, can you overcome the political challenges that, that uh, India faces? Can I, can I respond Yeah, to sure, that? go ahead. I think the, um, that's a very simplistic view of what is happening. Um, I, I know that um, it looks as if uh, nothing is happening in this country on infrastructure. There's a lot of conflict. There's a lot of dissonance. All that is true. But the numbers speak for themselves. If you look at what's happened in the last seven years, I don't think you could have predicted, certainly I could not have predicted seven years ago, that in these last seven years, total spending on infrastructure in this country as a share of GDP would double from 4% to what it is today, which is 8%. And within that, the share of privately developed infrastructure has actually grown 12 times from 0.3% of, uh, of GDP equivalent to almost 4% of GDP equivalent. We are spending $100 billion on infrastructure a year, likely to grow at 15% a year for the next three, four, five years. And the share of the private sector in that growth has been mind-boggling. You'd have to go back to 19th century United States to find this kind of muscular participation from risk-taking private entrepreneurs in the development of core infrastructure. Yes, we have phenomenal challenges that we will have to negotiate to get to our targets. And I'm not pretending for a nanosecond that we will not be an infrastructure short economy for the foreseeable future, but the potential and the momentum is very, very real. I know a lot of people try to ask questions out here. Uh, do we have time for one more question? Okay, one last question. I know the gentleman's been asked. Just excuse me, sir. Go ahead. Alessandro Bagnoli Bocchi from KCAC. I have a very short question. The panel has highlighted the need to, the possible unsustainability of subsidies, especially as related to renewable. You, Mrs. Sharma, highlighted that uh, in the case of solar, for example. And, but also the need to put on the table subsidies uh, to, the, to fossil fuels, Mrs. Betheril, and also the uh, need to put on the table implicit subsidies to, to other uh, sources of energy. Um, I was trying my mind to square the picture of subsidies and how you see it, right? What is viable, what is not viable, what can be sustained, and where should they go? Thank you. You want to take that, Ravi, on subsidies quickly and what you think the future is? Well, you know, my, my view is very simple. Whatever cannot stand on its own cannot run. So any business which is totally based on subsidy, in my view, it is not possible for it to have a long-term success. Uh, I agree with Antibai on the, on the uh, wind side that it is quite near to the general price which is there in the market. But somehow I feel on the solar part, uh, technology development is happening. There is no breakthrough which is happening, which will bring down the cost. And unless that happens, it will be totally surviving on the mercy of the government. 
Now, anything which is surviving on the mercy of the government, for it to become a common phenomena and to be bought that service by poor people or people whom, where you are going, who are not able to afford the normal electricity prices, it is um, uh, it's a good dream. I'm not saying that. I'm not saying it's, it's, not, it's not a good dream, but whether it will turn out to be a reality, it's, it's questionable as far as I'm concerned. Now, when it comes to subsidy, uh, there are two models of subsidy which can happen. The first model of subsidy is where you give subsidy to the developer. The second model of subsidy is, which is a different thing, where you give money to the consumer to buy it. Okay? Now, it depends as to which model you do it. In my view, as long as you can give subsidy and you can continue to give subsidy to developer, it will finally will not reach where it should go. This is my personal view. Okay? Although we are also putting, because we are able to sign contracts with the state governments, we are also putting solar, but we feel that the solar, uh, from that perspective, will become only successful if it is able to stand on its own. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for your time. What I'd like to do is uh, just thank all the panelists once again uh, for a great discussion. And I uh, appreciate all of you attending this session. Thank you very much.